Hi students! Um, this lecture is called the Canon, and it's also about the survey. And when I say the survey, I mean survey 1 and 2, and this goes for pretty much any history class that you take that is a survey, uh, art history classes, lots of different disciplines have surveys where you basically do uh, ancient to contemporary history in two different parts. But I wanted to start today um, by talking about the reading um, that you guys are assigned this week. Um, as you know, uh, hopefully you already know, this reading is not in the book, um, and that's because I'm assuming that many of you still don't have the book, and that's okay. So uh, hopefully you're already on top of that and either have ordered the book, and hopefully it'll be shipped soon or getting to your house soon, or you've decided to get the Revel version uh, that's a digital copy online for about $70. So again, email me if you have questions about that, but hopefully your book will be coming soon. I expect that you have it by sometime next week, as we will be uh, resuming material in the book uh, next week. But this week we have uh, an outside essay, and if you uh, still haven't found it, <clears throat> it's pretty easy to find. I have a link to it within cor the course folder for this week, and I also have a link on the le within the left-hand toolbar that says Extra Readings. Click on that and then you'll see uh, Mark Miller-Graham's essay, The Future of Art History and the Undoing of the Survey, as listed under week one. And so you'll click on that and take a read. Here are some of the questions that I hope you'll consider while reading. Number one is what is the canon and what does the author mean by canonicity? Number two, can you think off the top of your head of certain artworks that are in the canon already once you figure out what it actually is? Number three, what does the author claim to be the problem with chronology? Number four, what is meant by closure and how does closure hinder the study of art history? And finally, number five, what does the author suggest for the future of the discipline? So hopefully thinking about these questions as you're reading, let them guide you through, through your readings. And then I also wanted you to think about one more question as you uh, prepare to discuss this with your classmates. I want you to think about what you would do differently with the survey. So um, the author of the text, Graham, will offer what he thinks we should do be uh, better, right? But I want you to give your own opinion within that discussion form about what you think would work better with the survey, because he's very critical of the survey, as we all should be, because it's kind of uh, this kind of ancient thing, or at least very old uh, way of setting up uh, the survey course. And so, of course, change is good often, um, and so it's good to think about the ways in which we can change the survey and make it more accessible for students and for teachers. Oh, the one thing I did want you to do also, um, at this point in the lecture, if you still haven't uh, done in a Google image search for the term art history, please pause um, the lecture right now and go ahead and go to Google and put in art history in the search line when you do a Google search. And then I want you to think about whether or not the images that come up surprise you. So hopefully, well, maybe they will and maybe they won't. So if uh, you haven't done that yet, please pause this and go ahead and do that and then come back to it in just a second. Okay. So this is what comes up when you put in the history of painting. Um, so you can put in art history, history of painting, history of sculpture. A lot of different things bring up, um, for me, things that didn't surprise me. So this... Um, is what I mean by the canon. So do the reading and um, you'll see that this uh, lecture is kind of helping you through the reading uh, in certain ways. So the canon itself is uh, basically um, the important pieces in art history. So the pieces that are studied over and over and over uh, in the history of art. So the reason that I asked um, if this surprised you or not is because I'm interested in what you already understand to be, you know, art history. Um, because we've been basically fed uh, a certain type of art history throughout our lives. Whether or not, you know, we're interested in art at all or if we're artists. And I know this is an art history class, so it's likely that a lot of you are actually artists in the art program here. So you probably have seen art before, right? Um, we come across it in our everyday lives. A lot of art is part of pop culture as well. 
Um, and so it doesn't surprise me at all that I see a lot of kind of paintings that are part of our, our uh, contemporary culture here as well. For instance, here we see a Goya piece down here at the bottom. If you look over to, it's hard because I can't, oh, I can sh use the this. Um, here you have uh, ancient cave paintings in Lacoste, France. Uh, move up here, you've got Napoleon on horseback. A lot of uh, kind of salons, um, exhibition spaces being represented here. And this is just at the top, right? This is just the very top of the Google page. And as we all know, the most popular searches, the things that are clicked on the most, come up at the top. So really, our culture reifies uh, what um, the images that uh, come to our mind when we think of certain terms. And these are, you know, exemplified by Google search. So it's kind of interesting. And throughout the course, a few times I'll use Google search because I think it's an interesting experiment in thinking about the way in which our um, minds are already kind of made up, what we subconsciously think, the images that come to mind when we think of certain terms are often those that we see within Google search as well. So it's kind of interesting. Um, but what is the problem with the survey? So the main question that's kind of asked by uh, by the author of your reading for this week is um, he's thinking about the ways in which how the survey is intrinsically tied to power. So the survey actually begins as a history of art of the West, right? Um, it's interesting because here you basically see only westernized art. And by the West, what do I mean? Well, I mean basically Western Europe and America. And here it's mostly Western Europe. So we've got Spain, France, um, I don't know if I see any uh, Italian stuff here, some American stuff. But you're not going to see, for instance, uh, anything that's in Asia, um, anything that's in Africa, right? These non-West, uh, non-Western countries, okay? Uh, and continents, I should say. Um, so that's a problem, right? The survey basically begins from the West at the center and moves to the peripheries where we begin to study, you know, non-Western uh, countries. So this is really a big problem. And we have a bunch of different uh, um, writers of textbooks who reify this. Jansen is one of them. Gardner, you might have heard of Gardner's Art of the Ages is another. Hart is another. And these are all textbooks that have, you know, 10, 15 editions uh, that you can get. And they all start with the history of art in the West and then maybe, 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 um, you know, now their editions might add, um, you know, a, a chapter on Asia, maybe. Um, pro maybe not a chapter in India, but maybe, because that's becoming more uh, um, popular, right? And so it's interesting to think about uh, the ways in which the survey has been tied to power, because it's not as though this art history is the only art history. That's obvious, right? Uh, this canon that is created, uh, which basically is, you know, what we study, what is most popular, what comes up in the in the art history books, this canon is written by people, right? It's not like it just, uh, this book was just uh, there one day and this is what art history is. No, it was actually written by people, right? And so uh, people who wrote this were the people in power at the time when art history was kind of coming to be a discipline. And so who were those people? Well, they were usually uh, white men, uh, European white men. And so that's why we see a lot of emphasis on European uh, artists, as, uh, because that is what uh, the early theorists um, emphasized and what they uh, fought to keep in the canon as the masterpieces within uh, art. So my question to you is why do we stay tied to a survey when this is kind of not how we practice art anymore? Um, uh, art these days is much more democratic. Um, oftentimes we're always looking to uh, include outsiders, you know, uh, artists outside of this canon of art history. So why is it that our survey books want to stay tied to this kind of archaic model of art history, uh, the study of art history. So uh, what can be reformed uh, and what might replace the survey? And these are two questions that I want you to think about as you uh, write your discussion posts for later today. So there's a couple important notions I just want to touch on and be sure that you still do read the um, um, 
text because I'm just touching on a few things here because I wanted to make this short and sweet for you. But a few things I wanted to touch on. Um, again, we already talked about the canon, and basically canonicity is the dependence on the complete or ultimate consensual body of work that are most deserving of attention. And that's what we see here even through Google search. And here you can see in Google, I wrote in the history of sculpture. And of course, what do we have but uh, sculpture of the, of the West, for the most part. So here we have, uh, you know, some Greek sculptures. Ooh, now we have India here, so that's pretty awesome. Um, here we've got art of the Middle East. So you can see uh, Roman art here, um, Roman here, Roman here. <laughs> um, so we've got actually a little bit of a wider range here with the history of sculpture, but for the most part, it is from the West, and we only see a few examples that are outside of the West. So here's an important clip from the text um, when we talk about the canon. Graham uh, says, and I quote, in the end I think we need to recognize that the canon is not a yardstick for determining enduring timeless masterpieces, but an agent of power, the power to decide whose culture and whose views will set agendas for the rest of us, end quote. And that's on page 30 if you're curious about that. So basically what he's saying is rather than thinking of history as like a set of timeless masterpieces, and of course this is not a good way to think of art history because nothing is timeless, okay? Time happens um, and pieces change, okay? Because the way that we conceive of them changes as well. Um, but we should think of uh, the canon as an agent of power. The canon uh, is an agent, an agent of power in that it sets... Um, the standard for what is in and what is out. Who gets to be in the canon? Which artists? And who doesn't get to be in the canon? Uh, whose cultures do we study? And whose do we, do, do we not study? And whose agendas are um, at risk here? Um, so that's kind of an interesting quote there that I wanted to uh, lay out for you um, within the reading. So try to find that uh, if you're interested in more context there. An important thing that I think he brings up is a chronology, and chronology is a problem, he says. Um, and why is this? Um, he says that history, um, through the mode of chronology, is seen as a lin linear sequence. And so, for here, uh, for an example for you, um, I've taken basically an art history timeline from one of the important art history books, uh, Gardner's Art of the Ages. So a timeline like this would be in all of these kind of classical texts, and I actually think we have one in our book as well. But I have to say that Marilyn Stockstead is a little bit better, I think, than the other uh, art theorists who write these books, so that's why I've assigned this text. Um, but here we have uh, kind of your quintessential uh, art history timeline where you see a chronology of important uh, um, periods, right? They become, so art history becomes points on a timeline and it's used to teach art history through time and space. So you can see here, but what is the problem with this? Well, these events are ordered primarily according to temporal dates, right? Um, and it really overlaps the spatial uh, differences um, and and um, makes history into a vacuum that is uh, uh, that seems to be not affected spatially by other uh, by other events outside uh, the certain time and, and place. Okay, so how do we uh, think about um, the difference between ancient Egyptian art here at the beginning of the time timeline? Whoops and ancient Greek art, and then it, look, it ends here, and then there's ancient Roman art, but then there's this broader classical art that overlaps, and so it's kind of, um, it's confusing to have this chronology, right, this model in which everything is a point on a timeline, and so one thing he, uh, starts here and then ends there, and then the next thing starts here and ends there, and really this doesn't over, uh, allow for um, thinking about the way in which uh, external factors um, have an effect on a certain culture. So for instance, um, how did ancient Greek artists, uh, how were they informed by ancient Egyptian artists, right? That doesn't really allow for any talk about that. Um, the same goes for this type of things. Uh, so the Renaissance, um, when we think about the Renaissance, uh, we probably think about Italian art, right? But at the time of the Renaissance, during this period, Really important things were happening in China, in the Chinese arts and Japanese arts. 
um, outside of Italy, a lot was happening, right? But we have this uh, kind of archaic idea that Renaissance means Italian, and that it goes from here to here, right? And then mannerism and Baroque starts. And this is the kind of herein lies the problem, is that we don't really get to see what's happening in other uh, parts of the globe or during this kind of Renaissance movement. So there's problems here uh, with chronology, as you can see in the... Um, the author of your article, Graham, will emphasize that and talk more about that much more in depth. Another big problem that we see within the text um, uh, about the survey is closure. Closure very much overlaps with the problem of chronology. So here, closure is um, when we uh, basically all art historical texts, for the most part, um, use closure to create a satisfying end or a resolution. So um, for the history of art, right? So one movement starts here and then it ends here. So it's very similar to chronology and then it, uh, the next movement begins and there's this idea that we have this kind of narrative closure to each movement. When in fact movements didn't ever end, right? Think about the 1990s, uh, thinking more contemporarily. Perhaps some of you weren't even born yet, but that's okay. You can think about the 1990s. It actually, maybe it's more helpful for you to think about the year 2000. And how different was the year 2001 than the year 2000, right? There's not really that many differences between the year 2000 and the year 2001, um, but in art historical kind of um, chronology of um, those years might make it so that a movement ends in 2000 and then a new one begins in 2001. So think about the problems there. There's really not room for overlap and change. You know, it's the sudden change that doesn't allow for overlap between movements. And this is kind of a great example of what I'm talking about, is this overall, This also overlooks space. So um, here we have four different examples of Islamic art, okay? Or three, I'm sorry. We have the uh, Hagia Sophia, which is at the top of the page, these two images, here's the outside and here's the inside, which was created in the uh, 1500, uh, the 15, I'm sorry, the 500s. Um, and this is a Byzantine work that was then later changed into an Islamic work, okay? And then at the bottom, we have the Alhambra, which is created in southern Spain, in Granada, in 1333. And then, of course, this is probably an image you've all seen before, the Taj Mahal, and this is from the 1600s in India. So here we are in uh, Byzantium, in Turkey, on top, and then here we're in Spain, southern Spain, and here we're in India. And all of these would be under the umbrella of Islamic art, right? They'd all be in an Islamic art textbook, and they'd all be in a chapter on Islamic art. However, we, uh, with closure um, of, of Islamic art, you know, if it is a period itself, uh, how are we going to do that with these broadly uh, different styles, different locations, all influenced by um, their local surroundings in very different ways? So we have very different styles here as well. And so this is the problem with chronology and with closure. Um, just a couple of the problems that the author points out in the essay. Um, and the last thing I wanted to mention um, as part of this PowerPoint is how do we reform? And I'm trying to make this quick, so I wanted to skip over the last slide. Um, what do we reform here? And here we have the textbooks, uh, kind of the common textbooks. So here Jansen's, as I've mentioned, Marilyn Stockstead, who um, is the one you're uh, actually um, reading right now. She, uh, this is her larger essay, but then this is uh, Survey 1, Volume 1. Uh, which you might, may or may not have uh, by now. It also have, comes in different co uh, covers, so don't worry. And here's Gardner's Art Through the Ages. And see, Gardner uh, and Jansen uh, both start from the West especially, but then I like how Marilyn Stockstead oftentimes moves outside the West and emphasizes non-Western movements. But what can be reformed here? Um, and this I'm not going to give away because I want you to actually think about it yourself and I want to make sure you're doing that reading, okay? But there's about four different things that the author says that can be reformed. So what are these things? If I was in class with you, I'd ask you to tell me and we'd have a discussion about it, but instead I will leave this for the discussion boards. So I look forward to seeing what you say. And again, right at the end of the essay, you'll find um, that the artist actually, uh, the author actually gives us a few ideas for how he would change the survey if he could. So think about that, take a look at that reading, let me know if you have questions, I look forward to seeing what you have to say, 
And thank you for listening. I will see you next week.